So we open a week of discovery, of traveling around Europe to visit successful experiences and initiatives of uh, that work uh, on the ground to improve the life quality of the local inhabitants. In the experience of Interreg Europe, cooperation projects have the great power to bring to the attention of many interesting examples of the way policymakers on the ground implement actions, um, successful actions that mirror the um, political priorities of the higher levels of governance in the EU. Policymakers are faced uh, daily with the so-called grand challenges and uh, they are eager to understand uh, how to translate into concrete policy actions uh, the, the guidance of the EU in this respect. Today we meet Mr. Claude Turms, uh, Minister for Energy and Spatial Planning in Luxembourg. Welcome Minister Turms, thank you for being with Interreg Europe today. Good morning, so, Interreg. <laughs> we uh, talk about the Green Deal. The Green Deal is the main paradigm of the European Union. Stays, uh, a huge uh, investment is made for the current programming period and the directives that uh, somehow brought to it, that shaped it, if we can say that, uh, and to which you also contributed as a member of the European Parliament, uh, refer to policy areas that are fundamental, of course, related to mainly energy, uh, renewables, uh, energy efficiency, but also biodiversity protection, uh, climate change adaptation. These policy areas, uh, among these, there are some that somehow create harsher debates in the European arena than others. We believe that cooperation, of course, uh, can be made easier when there is a shared view on the path towards sustainability. Um, so where do you see a broader uh, European consensus within the Green Deal objectives? And are we going in the right direction to accelerate decarbonization, to reach the targets for a carbon neutral or climate neutral economy in 2050 and protect biodiversity? Um, I think there is more and more understanding with uh, European citizens and also decision makers that we have one planet, we will be 10 billion, uh, there is no other planet. Um, Europe is 500 million inhabitants. The strength of Europe is that uh, it is aggregating a lot of smaller countries, even Germany and France are small compared to China, India, US. So together, uh, we can not only do our part on uh, having a, a basically respecting nature, respecting the, the boundaries of ecosystems, but we can also be a major motor of global uh, sustainability of uh, new technology. For example, solar energy was developed in Europe, uh, wind energy was developed in Europe, zero energy houses was developed in Europe. So, so we were in Europe often the ones who in our research labs came up with the uh, innovations and we were also the first to implement them at the, at the larger scale. And, and of course, uh, with um, the latest reports on climate change, uh, it is clear we have much less time than we thought. Uh, so uh, zero carbon 2050 is in a certain sense, not the wrong way to put it. It's more, um, what can we do the next 10 years? Because if we don't get major decreases of the CO2 emissions between now and uh, 2030, uh, basically we will not be able to control uh, dangerous climate change. And we have a second, uh, of course, big, uh, problem with nature, which is our loss, extreme loss of biodiversity, which also comes from urban sprawl, using uh, too much uh, land for, for all kinds of infrastructure, but also from our um, not very respective of nature way to do agriculture. So what can uh, Europe bring? What can the Green New Deal bring? So first of, I think it's important that Europe puts targets. That's uh, what, what we do through European legislation. And then we need also pro programs where we show uh, what are the best solutions and where we get some bottom, uh, bottom up. And that's exactly what Interreg uh, can bring. So um, now with the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, it gets even more clear that fossil fuels are not good for environment, but fossil fuels are also a way 
uh, to basically uh, create harm, to, to basically blackmail other countries. That's exactly the situation where we are in. And in that respect, having uh, now a speeding up of energy efficiency uh, and also speeding up of renewables. And the third issue is interconnecting Europe also, uh, for example, with electricity grids, but also then afterwards with uh, green hydrogen uh, infrastructure. And that needs, of course, to be done uh, at, at the national level, at the European level, but then we need also every town, every village to, to buy in, and we need the citizens to buy in. And in that respect, what we are, for example, doing in Luxembourg is we have launched an international consultation, which is called Luxembourg in Transition, in that we had uh, European uh, teams, uh, inter multidisciplinary teams, who not only looked at the individual building, but who looked at whole areas. Whole areas, how do you build a new area, uh, car-free, zero carbon, in bringing nature uh, into a new area, but also, uh, and that's very important for Europe, we have a lot of existing building stock, and we need to redynamize the existing building stock, uh, densify it, but also taking out cars, uh, parking them in silos and not on the streets, and so, and, and through that, uh, making more space for, for the children to play, for greenery to be to be present in, in, our, in our area. So it's about, uh, I think one of the most important issues also now to test with programs like Interact is to go beyond the individual building and to have a strategy for a whole area, for a whole, uh, basically, uh, part of, of, a, of a city. And then, of course, rural areas play a very important role because the big uh, solar, the big wind uh, onshore will be in the rural areas. And that will be a new opportunity also for rural areas, if it is well done, also to have new income uh, in, in, in parts of Europe where, where sometimes today you have uh, less income. So uh, it's, it's, it's all about also now having in, interact the possibility uh, to, to get this kind of new testing. Uh, and the, the new frontier is uh, zero carbon and zero net land take. I think these two issues have to be combined. Combined together. Thank you, Mr. Minister Toms. You mentioned Interreg. Indeed, uh, in particular, Interreg Europe is um, a capacity building program uh, for policymakers. We offer this week the opportunity for all organizations involved in uh, designing regional development policies to meet, to exchange, to learn, uh, to witness successful examples across Europe on well, mainly uh, topics that are uh, closely related to the new European Bauhaus, protection of biodiversity, Buddha's um, sustainable construction material, citizen-led energy projects. Um, we believe also, as you said, that uh, cooperation is um, a shortcut for increasing the skills of policymakers, for learning and ultimately to deliver better policies. So in your view, what is the added value of cooperation? Uh, across different parts of Europe, and um, in your experience, what is the most powerful way to learn from, from others? The most powerful ways to learn is to speak to each other, to listen to each other. At the end of the day, the real value of the European project is bringing people together, bringing ideas together, and that is uh, what, what we do uh, through Interact, and, and therefore, for example, our Luxembourg in transition, we are now uh, uh, basically teaming up with DG Radio also to, to, to bring it to other parts of Europe. So we, we, are, we have an, an internet fora where we work together with the uh, bus country, with uh, certain uh, people in, in Eastern Europe, with, with Germany, with France. So and that's important that we share uh, our, our ideas. Um, and it's, it's, as for me, it's relatively evident. Um, zero carbon and zero net land take is... is um, that's the questions, but the answers to that, uh, we don't all have some. We know the questions today, so we need a lot of uh, experimenting uh, and then sharing of ideas. And uh, one important aspect is also uh, technology alone will not, uh, help, will not bring us far enough. So we need what we call lifestyle changes, which, and, and that is also where urban planning, where, where planning in general comes in, where citizens participation comes in. If I want to re-engineer a city from being a car-centered city to be an, 
uh, a city where, where human beings have more space to meet, to, to have fun, to, to have a drink. So uh, I need to, to re-engineer to, to have a completely different approach to public spaces, to the streets. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, going beyond just uh, a technology. That's also, uh, it, it, is, it is also, so I, I need to get the locals then to endorse this, to be in the game. And therefore, uh, I think one, one aspect which we should maybe even more highlight in the interact is uh, citizens' participations and also all kinds of new forms to bring citizens into uh, also not only at the end of a project to come in and to be informed, but to be a full part in the design of, of basically the, the livelihoods where they live in. Sure, you're right. And I think we are going in that direction, luckily, when we talk about governance and the involvement of, of, of citizens in project. And we will do that more and more also in Inter-Europe. A last question for you, um, Minister Turms. Actually, a kind request, um, although you are already doing that, uh, I think by nature, but a, quite, a kind request um, to address our audience with a word uh, charged with positive energy. So policymakers have uh, big responsibilities. They are faced with unprecedented challenges these days. And even we as common citizens are sometimes caught by the overwhelming awareness of what may lay ahead of us in the coming, uh, upcoming decades. And here I would like to, um, to quote one um, Fr French sociologist, Edgar Morin, who says, I wish you strength, courage, and lucidity <laughs> we have the need to live in small oases of life and fraternity. So with our success stories across Europe, we want to show that these oases of life and fraternity exist. We want to connect them. We want to make them grow together. Um, what is your own, Minister Tom's uh, oasis of life and fraternity? And what advice would you give to policymakers in these challenging times? Um. So I, I give you one example, and, and uh, it, it is also coming from Interact. I think what, what is important is reconnecting with nature also as a person. And for example, we, have, we had the opportunity to have a fantastic Interact project, which is uh, Nightlight, which, is, uh, which was uh, triggered by, by a province uh, in northern Holland to basically um, allow us again to see the stars we, and, and to reconnect with uh, basically what, what our... our uh, let's say ancient people did over 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 centuries, which is um, being fascinated uh, by by uh, uh, by seeing the stars and, and then being aware we are part of a, of, of a, a bigger uh, collective in a certain way of, of a bigger story. And in this nightlight, uh, so what we we did with uh, with. Uh, cooperation between Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, some Spanish uh, regions is really um, uh, eliminating these kind of uh, street lights, which, which is basically hindering us to have a dark sky. And then also organizing um, performances where, where, uh, where, where, for example, during summer, when, when we have uh, good weather, also uh, warmer nights that uh, we, we just uh, organize events where we can uh, watch at the, at the stars. And I think um, having, in, in a world where um, a lot of us, more and more of us live in cities, what I think is very important, at least for me, who lives also in the city, is this reconnection with nature. One way being um, taking some time, uh, especially during summer, to, to and, and then organizing in our country's areas, which basically, uh, are the areas where the sky is still dark and where you can see the stars, which is often no more the case when you live in a city. And the other thing where, where I'm now working on is um, bringing nature back to the cities, um, allowing citizens who live in cities to have a green belt around their cities. And uh, I'm, I'm working on a new concept, which I, I for the moment, the working title is um, nature experiences. So, so I think we need to bring uh, the, the fact that we are a part of nature. Uh, we need to organize in our parks, in the cities, um, on our public spaces, areas where you just can sit down and have this reconnection, maybe with an old tree which, which shows you uh, this tree is rooted 
uh, it has beautiful leaves. So this kind of reconnecting with nature. If we don't understand that we are a part of nature, that we have to respect of nature, nature, that there is nothing to negotiate with nature, um, I think then um, we 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 are not up also as polit political decision makers to understand uh, what we have to do. What we have to do is organize inclusive life. Uh, on, on, on in Europe, but respecting the ecological boundaries. And for that, you need also this, uh, basically this feeling for nature and understanding nature. Uh, that's at least what, what I try to do and what I try also to put uh, into place in Luxembourg. Thank you very much, Minister Tums, for your words. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you uh, for being with us today. Your presence is extremely valuable, of course, for the internet uh, community. I'm sure our audience has appreciated your, your uh, powerful statements. Um, we are reaching the end of this uh, interview. Uh, good luck for your work and we hope to see you again uh, in our cooperation world. We see that you are a, a, a fan of Interreg uh, Europe and thank you for, <laughs> for your support. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. -bye. Bye. So after this very interesting exchange with Minister Turms on uh, environmental and energy uh, policy challenges, um, we can move on to the second part of this uh, introductory panel. Um, which will give more emphasis to innovation as a response to the grand challenges we've been talking about. And I would kindly ask my colleague Mark Pattinson to join me on stage. Hello, Mark. Good morning, Elena. Good morning to you. Uh, without further ado, I would let you introduce our next speaker and continue this, uh, this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. As Eleanor said, my name is Mark Pattinson. I'm one of the uh, policy experts supporting the uh, Interreg Europe uh, team on the policy learning platform. I specialize in the innovation and research field. And today it's a great pleasure to have uh, with me Professor Elvira Uyara, who's one of the directors at the Institute of Innovation uh, Research at the University of Manchester. Uh, Elvira, please join us. Thank you. So today we're going to try and shed some light on some of the key challenges facing Europe on innovation policies. And we know that the, the policy debate at the European level uh, currently recognizes the societal challenges and their role in driving innovation policies. These societal challenges are massive social, environmental issues that transcend national borders, such as climate change, inequality, that disruptive migration and global pandemics that have real potential to generate negative effects on large numbers of people, communities, and the planet as a whole. Uh, we recognize that they need to be addressed collaboratively because their independence and the need for effective responses depends on the ability to gather contributions from a range of stakeholders, policymakers, academia, businesses and the civil society. So um, these grand challenges aren't particularly new, uh, um, but how can the policymakers work or do things differently? Uh, how can these grand uh, challenges and their uh, reactions be developed at a local level? Well, I agree absolutely that regions play a fundamental role. Uh, there will be no solutions to grand challenges if, uh, without the involvement of, of regions. Um, we talk about grand challenges and global challenges, but challenges are also local and highly situated, so uh, they are interpreted differently at the local level. Uh, regions face these challenges differently, um, they interpret them differently. We, uh, we mentioned that they are highly contested as well. They're, they're wicked because they are complex and there are multiple interpretations. So regions need, need to find their own understanding and um, they need to uh, engage with their uh, stakeholders to, um, um, to address them. Um, and also regions are differently placed to find solutions 
uh, to those challenges as well. So I would argue that there is um, a, a geography of problems and, and challenges and also a geography of solutions. And in the past, we just were focusing on, on mainly on the innovation side and the technology side. But I think the uh, moving forward, we need to see, okay, how do we um, um, understand how regions frame these problems, how they collaborate with each other at, for the, uh, uh, um, in the understanding and framing of these problems and also trying to find solutions. Uh, so that's, um, that's a really important uh, factor um, in, in, in terms of the role of, of regions. Regions are also where a lot of the policy mixes to uh, find solutions uh, lie as well. Uh, so implementation of policies for grand challenges uh, are going to be mainly taking place at the local level. Um, and because grand challenges are complex and contested, there are gonna be tensions um, and these tensions are going to be felt at the local level as well. So uh, there might be tensions between different objectives, uh, between uh, achieving competitiveness at the local level, between um, uh, uh, trying to pursue sustainability. Uh, so regions are well placed to understand these tensions and um, and work through these tensions as well um, um, in, in, in collaboration with local actors. Uh, so regions fundamentally play a, a big role in, 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 this, in this agenda. And also in terms of the policy mix, uh, regions, um, problems don't, don't stop at the border, of course. Exactly. And they will have to uh, coordinate with other regions, at the, also with, with other levels of government. Uh, but also they're well placed to, uh, to not only use the tools at their disposal, but also innovating tools and experiment. I think with soil specialization, we know that uh, regions just to try to uh, broaden the policy mix, experiment a bit more, uh, use tools, I've, I've done some work on, on public procurement. Uh, so how do you work with the demand side to turn those challenges into market opportunities that can lead to innovation? Uh, so I think starting with the problem side, uh, how they can translate into innovation and how regions can work with uh, different actors uh, using different tools and in collaboration with other regions at, at other levels of government, I think that's where we can start to see uh, transformative um, change. Yeah, you've put your finger on some key messages there. I think the, the, the challenges, as you say, do not stop at borders, yet we have to find local solutions, but you know, climate change, uh, mm -hmm. migration challenges, all require a coordinated approach. Um, the other interesting point I think you raised is the role of the, the public purse, you know, public procurement to support innovation, uh, using your local business community to help deliver some of your local actions, I think is an area where we can spend probably a bit more time thinking more creatively. Um, resilience, sovereignty mm -hmm. are part of the themes in which local action can actually contribute from, from the mm -hmm. bottom-up perspective. So, well, thanks for those first those points. Um, the last question we'd really want to sort of get your, your, your view on is that given the, um, the sort of ongoing policy debate on innovation, uh, interesting to see what's the, the academics uh, perspective. We know in your institute, uh, uh, there are you know, researchers looking at these issues. Mm -hmm. what, what's on the horizon? What's, what, what can we see as being in the future for innovation policies? And maybe you can shed some light on the, what are the current sort of key discussions within the academic community, mm -hmm. uh, what some of the future trends uh, could be over the uh, the horizon. Uh, mm -hmm. We could maybe get your view on that, please, Professor Elvira. Thank you for, for that question. Yeah, in the academic community, there's a lot of debate around uh, mission-oriented policy, transformative-oriented policies, um, and uh, transitions, of course. Um, that's, we have key researchers here at Manchester working on sustainable transitions, which, of course, have a key 
uh, geographical implications. So this this um, you can't think of transitions if you don't think about the um, the geographies of transitions and the role the regions can play in that. Um, so in terms these these um, areas of work have pointed out uh, or have developed useful frameworks that uh, regions can use that uh, countries are and regions are already using in fact. Um, which are helpful in terms of navigating this complexity that we were talking about in, in innovation policy, in terms of trying to understand the trade-offs uh, um, and tensions um, that are associated with um, um, the, uh, the, the multiple goals uh, that innovation policy is trying to achieve. So how do we understand these, these tensions on multiple levels? And also the idea of uh, policy mixes. So there's a lot of work uh, now being done on, on policy mixes for sustainability. Uh, so if using different tools and different instruments, uh, how do we can we combine them in such a way that we minimize those tensions and we uh, maximize synergies uh, and complementarities uh, for transformative change. So um, work around policy mixes is a, is a very, um, uh, interesting and uh, very uh, rich area of research that's been going on for, for some time now. Um, also in terms of, I suppose, uh, metrics and indicators. Uh, so what works, um, uh, these policies need to rethink in terms of evaluation. Uh, of course, we need to um, uh, assess and measure progress. Um, so I think the academic community can help in terms of um, those metrics and evaluation frameworks. Uh, there's now, um, as we know, um, uh, analytical tools using big data that can help as well. Um, so, and I think also a final point, for perhaps I mean, uh, particularly uh, interesting for me is how do we bring all this to the regional level? Um, and how do we um, maximize value and anchor value at the regional level? Um, how do we uh, work towards those associated challenges and create those solutions? And at the same time, um, uh, bring or, or, or help regions capture most of that value uh, that bring um, economic well-being and resilience uh, moving forward. Um, so the um, achievement of those multiple goals, uh, sustainability, um, uh, inclusion, and, and regional development, um, and what are the best frameworks and, and actions for that uh, is a particular, um, particular promising area of research I'll, I'll argue as well. Thank you for those uh, messages. I, I'm particularly uh, uh, alert to the, the messages about policy uh, evaluation, mm. the metrics. Uh, I think policy impact is uh, clearly something where the academic mm. community can can help the, uh, the policy makers uh, ensure the, you know, the targets are being uh, addressed uh, and uh, we can measure performance. Uh, nobody wants a, a sort of a um, 75 uh, metrics uh, indicator table, but I think we can come out with some macro uh, policy impact indicators and the policy maker will be uh, much uh, supported. And you, you highlighted also the new tools, metrics, the, the, uh, the, the data driven uh, approach that we can maybe bring from the academic and mm -hmm. other uh, spheres of academia in mm -hmm. the, from the you know, advanced uh, uh, algorithms that can perhaps be used to analyze big data uh, can be also very relevant. Perhaps last point is that the fluidity and the necessary exchange, it's not mm -hmm. a, a, a linear process. So I think working together yeah. with the academic community would, would ensure we, we get some real time benefits. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the, we, we've run out of time, Professor Elvira. So it was uh, uh, very useful to have you participating in this uh, launch event for our uh, policy learning platform week. And we are uh, Hopefully we will stay in touch. As you know, we have many other opportunities with the policy learning platform. So it's a real pleasure to, to share uh, this short time with you this morning. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for inviting me.